Good afternoon, and you're very welcome to this virtual launch event for the Tum Oral History Project. My, ni my name is Rachel English, and I'd like to start by thanking everybody who has joined us on Facebook this afternoon, and an especially warm welcome to all of those who've joined us who have a connection to the Tum Mother and Baby Home or are survivors of the home. Now I know as has been the case with, with so many things lately that the hope had been that this could be a proper launch if we could call it that and that we'd all be in the one place and there would be an opportunity to all have a chat and a cup of tea and that would have been wonderful, but I suppose, as the politicians say, we are where we are, and it's just fantastic that so many people have been able to come together this afternoon for what I think is a really important event. And I don't use the word important lightly. I remember over a year ago, first hearing about this project, I think we did a piece on Morning Ireland about it, and thinking what a brilliant idea it was because in one way or another, what happened in the mother and baby homes and in other institutions in this country, it affected almost every street and almost every townland, no matter who you know and no matter where you go. I'm just always taken aback by how many families in this country have a story and how for so many years, so many people were scared to tell that story and it is so important that those stories are now told and that we all listen to them because they're not ancient history they matter because so many lives were damaged and so many people were affected and because so many people are in a position where they still have questions and they're not getting any answers and I think as well that in a, a project like this one is so important because so many official records are missing or incomplete. And in some cases, we know that they were just downright falsified. And, you know, I remember hearing somebody say a couple of years ago, it's amazing how many floods and fires there were in these homes because the extent to which documents are missing is just shocking. Um, I think it's also important because when I was growing up, history tended to show things from the perspective of people with power. It was about a string of dates and it was about powerful men. And this project, although focusing obviously on the tomb mother and baby home and on the stories of the people from that home, it's really about countless thousands of lives in this country over decades. If you'd like to contribute to the conversation this afternoon, please do so via the comments on Facebook. Your comments, questions, whatever, are more than welcome. Now, in a little while, we'll be hearing from two of the people whose stories are told in the podcast that form part of this project. I've been listening to those podcasts over the last day or so. And I have to say, even though I thought I was familiar with these stories, th there are parts of them that just stopped me in my tracks and again to use that word I just think they're really really important. Before we do any of that I'm going to hand over to Dr Sarah Ann Buckley of NUIG who can introduce some more of the participants and also explain what's been happening over the past several months and what will be happening here this afternoon. So Sarah Ann, you're very welcome. Just tell us a little, if you would, about this project, about what you've been doing and about what the plans are. Thanks so much, Rachel. And uh, thanks to you for doing this and to everyone that we're gonna meet this afternoon. So the project really began, as you said, last year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. And then my colleague, John Cunningham will, will elaborate more in uh, the session on arts but what we're really doing today is we're showcasing some of the outputs so far so the podcast that you mentioned it's a three-part podcast and it's narrated by the UNESCO patron of the Child and Family Research Centre Killian Murphy and I think you just made a really important point it's three stories but what we've learned in the project so far is that there's so many threads and commonalities between the stories of those that were in tune and other mother and baby homes or on institutions. So we really feel like we're, we're trying to get that uh, message across. And that was 
co-produced by NUI Galway, uh, Lorna Farron, and also Orla Higgins. So we we're obviously really happy with that. And um, the other, I guess, thing that we want to show today is our exhibition of survivor biographies and photographs. And the photographer Fionn McCann just did, we feel, an amazing job in, I guess, showing the survivors as I suppose I would know them as you'll meet Teresa and Peter in a while. Um, the big part of the project for us is that this is about what happened in the institution, but it's also about what happened in people's lives afterwards. So how their life course went. And these photographs are of people today. Um, their biographies are their interpretation of how their life went and you know, we think that's really relevant, this bigger story. And then the last thing I, I suppose I want to highlight before we, we look briefly at the, the exhibition is we have our website up and running, which is, is a big deal for us because um, that is where our archive of testimonies is going to be. So that is where these stories will sit in the James Hardiman Library, which is directly linked to our website. And for us, and I know for the survivors and advocates that we have spoken to, this is something that will be used by researchers, it will be used by younger people, it will be something that is their story and the way they want it to be told and available. And I think that's really important to us and also to the survivors and the advocates. Um, so I just want to kind of, they're really what we're showcasing today. But more generally with the project, I just want to really encourage people to get in touch with us. We've been interviewing survivors so far, but we also want to talk to families and we want to talk to people in the community because this is a conversation for all of Irish society, as we know. Um, luckily, there's many artistic and academic projects going on in, in other areas, but we feel like if we look at the Tume Institution, and we get as many views as we can, it's going to be beneficial to, to everyone else. So I'm just going to, uh, Dave, if you don't mind, just the brief clip of the podcast and uh, some of the slides from the exhibition, just briefly to show people. slow to use the word home because it's not home. It was never home. Institution is the word I'd use. Once the day I was born and the day I came out there, life stood still. Well, they never let me look after another child after what I did. It was the end of May 2014 and I will never forget that because it was from that moment on that my life changed, was completely turned upside down. Thanks, Dave. Um, so that is uh, just a brief look at our, our what we're showcasing today. And just the last point I'll make uh, before I introduce the, the president of NUI Galway, uh, Kieran O'Hogartig. NUI Galway has, I suppose, really backed this project, as has the Galway University Foundation. But a year ago, when the fifth interim report of the Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Inquiry was published, there was also a reference to Galway Medical School and because of that and because of the survivors that got in touch with us about that we also have looked at our own history in the university and I think that's really another important factor in this so we're going to have a, a very long report in September on Galway Medical School but I think what's key to us is that um, we look at ourselves but also um, we have two preliminary findings that we will be announcing today. One is that um, none of the, the infants that were of concern, there was no connection with the Tume Institution. And the other point is that uh, we 
also have some issues over the numbers. So I think this is a story about the two moral history project, but also how the university has been um, approaching this. So I'm just going to pass over to the president of NUI Galway, Kirana Hogartig, to uh, talk a bit about this project and the university's uh, response and support. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah, and I guess the fault show really top awesome good shift and unveiling on Ranona. And just to, as I've uh, said in, in this context before, I think NUI Galway is particularly pleased to uh, be here with you and to stand with, with you uh, in uh, telling your stories, uh, because I think it's a very important part of the role of the university. Um, and as Rachel mentioned at the beginning, history is often written uh, by the victor uh, where, and, and by people of power where in fact there's great power and great enabling, we hope, in uh, your stories being told and also being kept for future reference. So uh, this is part of a, an archive uh, and an archive is always available for research for the future. So we're particularly pleased to uh, empower uh, members who've been involved in the Tomb Babies Institution, as was said in the clip earlier, uh, and whose experiences and life is intertwined with it. Uh, because this is a very powerful part of the experience uh, and history of, of uh, the, the, the darker parts of, of what uh, Irish society uh, was and, and sometimes is still about. And our university has a role in both challenging that uh, and recording it uh, for the future. And we, we thank you for your role in that. Thank you for the privilege of, of working with you uh, in, in this context. Um, secondly, uh, this fits very much with the values of the university. Um, as a university community, we developed a, a strategy which we launched uh, late last year, uh, seems like a long time ago now. Uh, and as part of that, there, there were a couple of things that, that, that really chime with uh, this particular project and the experiences uh, of lives lived in this context. Uh, one is that we are here for our students, our society and the public good. And as part of that, we're very conscious that NUI Galway is part of society, not apart from society. And no more than any part of society, uh, uh, we need to examine ourselves and our own role in that regard. Uh, and uh, as Saren has mentioned, uh, the Galway Medical School was mentioned in, in the Commission report. Uh, we have found, first of all, that uh, the uh, connections were not with the Tume Institution per se, but that we did have a much smaller number, uh, but some uh, um, uh, babies which, who came to us and who were uh, in our care, if you like, uh, in, as in, in the anatomy school, and we want to memorialize that group. Uh, and we, it's something we, we intend to do over the next uh, coming months when, when, uh, when the context allows, is that we would in some way create and recreate the memory of those uh, babies who came to us uh, and, and the, the, the context in which uh, they, they, uh, they came to us and, and, and were uh, uh, available to, for use in, in the School of Anatomy. Um, and memorialising that particular group, I think, is particularly important to us and recognising that uh, here were people too and that we would like to uh, take on board the role the university played in that regard. Uh, in some ways, an often a valuable role, in some ways a role of which uh, we need to examine and question and which we uh, need to, to recognise the part we played uh, in society, uh, sometimes uh, a darker part than we would have liked, uh, and certainly than we would like now. Uh, and then in the context of, of the strategy, we developed a number of, of um, values. And again, this particular project chimes very much with, with these values. The first of those was respect. And we always felt that the greatest of these is respect. And today, and in this project, and as we develop this project for the future, at its heart is respect and we respect those involved in the Tume Institution, those whose lives uh, were uh, very often diminished by the experience in wh uh, which you had. And we hope that by giving that respect in some way, we restore something to you, uh, because we recognise as a university that anyway, Galway is also an institution of society, uh, that we uh, hope that in this project that we will find ways in which we can, again, recognise your value uh, and the value uh, of yourselves as citizens, as human beings, as people uh, who are 
worthy of respect and deserving of respect like like any other. Uh, and we're very pleased to be uh, part of that. And the second value, I think, which which this uh, particular project chimes with is, is that value of sustainability. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sustaining the power of the archive, the power of the story, allowing you to tell your story, which in itself we hope is restorative. Uh, maybe often not enough, but we hope uh, is restorative in many ways. And we look forward to working with you in, as, you, as we have already, in uh, developing an archive of oral history, which can often be a very powerful history. History is not just what is written, but what is understood. And history is not just what is in paper, but also what is uh, part of our memories. And I think that's a very important part of this project is recognizing and valuing that uh, and sustaining that for future generations. Uh, it's also excellent work and that's a value which we have particularly uh, been uh, uh, um, pleased to support in the context of the historical work being done. It is excellent work and uh, it respects uh, others by doing excellent work on hopefully on your behalf. Uh, and we hope again that this is the university serving its public. Uh, and that we, we fulfill a, a role here, which is a, ro a role of service and a role that is a benefit, a role that is for the public good in that uh, profound sense, which we hope we, uh, that, that we can play that role uh, today and, and, and uh, in this project for the future. And then the final value that I think this captures very nicely is the value of openness. And as Sarah Ann mentioned, openness is not only in the context of this project, which, which is really important to us, but openness to the experience of others to walking in other people's shoes, to understanding other people's experience. Openness as an institution to people who don't normally see the university as their place. And I often tell the story that I grew up near the university, walked into town when I did through the university, and therefore the university became part of the furniture of my life, if you like. That is not the case for everybody. And I'm particularly keen as president of NUI Galway that we are a university that opens its gates uh, virtually and when we can in other ways to all citizens, to those who uh, don't necessarily always find the university to part, be part of their furniture. I'm particularly keen to reach out to other communities uh, to welcome you to the university. And this project is very much at the core of that, that this is a way in which a university as a, an institution of society opens itself up uh, to your experience, opens itself up to you becoming part of what we are as a university and opens itself up to learning from you. Because very often universities are taken as places where we teach, but they're also places where we learn. And we hope that we learn through your experience. And in that way, going back to our original values and original strategy, that in that way we serve our students, we serve our society, we serve our planet better. And that is the real privilege of being involved today, that you're allowing us uh, to be part of your story and that you're, you're being open to us too. And we're re really privileged and really uh, pleased to be part of that story. And that in this story, we will also learn and that future generations will learn through us and through you too. So Gamil Mahagav, it's a very important part of what it is to NUI Galway to, to be uh, part of this story and to support you in, in telling your story. And I'm particularly pleased as president of NUI Galway uh, in this time and at this time to be with you and uh, I look forward to supporting the work as it continues into the future. Thank you. Kieran O'Hogarthy, thank you very much. Well, as we've been saying, central to this project are the survivors of the institution in June. There'd be no project without them and they're the people who've not just generously and bravely shared their stories but in so many cases, the people who've continued to campaign so that not just their questions are answered, but the questions of other people too. And I'm delighted to say that we're joined by two such people, both of whom um, feature in this project and feature in the podcasts mentioned earlier. And we heard those little clips earlier. Yes. Teresa O'Sullivan joins us and Peter Mulryan <coughs> joins us. And they were both born in tune. And you're both very welcome. It's, it's lovely to see you. Teresa, let's start with you. What do you know about your earliest years? Well, uh, it was only some recently that I found out that in the last number of years that I was in tune. I think one of the things that I didn't know I was there at all until I met my mum in 1990. 
And that was my first experience ever hearing about it. One of the things I suppose that I'd like to point out today is that she told me very, very little. Uh, we never spoke much about it at all. But the one thing that I um, sticks with me all the time is the fact that whenever I bring up when I was little, she'd always have that faraway look in her eye. And it always I always knew there was something more than what she was saying. And when I look back on it now, if I had known then what I know now, I would have asked way more questions about my childhood at that time. But I just had this, I suppose, respect for her that I knew there was hurt there. I didn't know what it was, but I certainly knew there was something. So it is only in the last number of years when Chum uh, hit the headlines that I really started asking questions. I met up with many, many survivors. I joined groups. And in the last number of years, I could honestly say that it, it's nearly the trauma kind of starting all over again, because I don't remember my time in Chum. I was there for about two years, but my body remembers. And I think that's something that's very prevalent and it has defined my life right up to even today. Peter, tell us about your earliest years. What do you know about your time in Tune? What, if anything, do you remember? There's nothing I can remember of Tune. <clears throat> Only the day I was, uh, the, door, the gate was opened and I was let out and put into an ambulance with two people, um, a male and female. I uh, was presumed the driver and um, the nurse who was leading me to where I was being brought to. I hadn't a clue where I was going. I was only four and a half. And that's the only time I remember the, the outside of those walls. I have no memory whatsoever of the inside of it. But, and um, I was, I didn't know where I was going. Went to about 20 miles on a journey. Not a clue. All I noticed the trees moving as it was we travelled along the road, something I never had seen. And then we come to a stop an hour later and um, I was let out and uh, it was a dreary old day. And it was January or February, early February. And uh, I saw this two-story house. I walked in the back, into the back of the house. It was very dreary. And uh, I, I met two people. Uh, an elderly woman, she was in her seven, mid-70s, and, uh, and there was a, a man there who was in his 50s. So I had a clue where I was going, but I noticed again the wind moving the trees. And when I went into the house, I saw a dog on the table wagging his tail. I hadn't a clue what that animal was. The man the moon at four and a half. Now, when you think of children now, what they know at four and a half, I just hadn't a clue what it was. But... Um, a nice fire on, and um, I like the heat of it because I noticed the heat, because probably where we were in Shum, it was probably very cold and damp. But, um, and then we're shown to the bedroom, which was nice white cl clothes. Uh, that really stuck out in my mind, the whiteness of the clothes, while probably in Shum there were only grey stuff, grey and dark walls and all that stuff. And I, I remember that, and my bed was a small iron cot. That's why I slept in for for some time. And uh, also there was a, a double iron bed, and uh, it wasn't too long, and I was put into that bed with the woman of the house. And the reason I was put in there was to keep her warm. It wasn't to keep me warm. But uh, that was it. I didn't mind. I was warm in there. And... Uh, that's the first uh, initial uh, memories I have of um, at four and a half. You didn't have a particularly good childhood. And there's one part in the podcast that I wanted to ask you about, because it's just one line. But like I was saying earlier, it was one of those lines that stopped me in my tracks, where you talk about, as a young boy, watching other children playing, and they were the other side of a fence or a hedge or something. And you just wanted to be able to join in and just have a little bit of fun for a while. I was denied an awful lot of things, but that's one that sticks out very clearly in my mind. It was about 15 or 16 between adults and children um, from, say, eight, seven and eight upwards, playing hurling, playing football there for a couple of hours of a Sunday um, before noon. 
And uh, all I could do was look out through the hedge, tears in my eyes, couldn't join them. The laughter and the noise of the Horleys was getting me, even though I never saw the likes before. But I saw the reaction they had was running after the ball and, you know, jostling one another and clapping one another and helping one another around, you know. But I was denied at that, and that locked an awful lot out of me. And I often asked the question, why couldn't I join those? But I discovered I wasn't allowed to damage my shoes or my clothes. That's all it was all about. Yeah, it's just one of those things, like I say, that really struck me because in some ways it's a small thing, but in other ways it's absolutely massive. Teresa, tell us about your experience growing up. I think you had a rather better experience. Yes, um, and just to say there, I would have left Joom on the 20th of October 1958 and um, I was transferred to St. Patrick's Orphanage in Cork. And I subsequently went to hospital then for six weeks because they diagnosed that I had chronic abscess in my ears, which uh, wasn't said from tune by the time I had actually gone to Cork. So I suppose something that I just want to say at the beginning of my adoption time is that I went to my adopted parents with very, very severe chronic ear problems from tune. And I suppose one of the things is they were so loving um, it was West Cork and they too actually didn't know anything about Tune. They had gone to St. Patrick's um, Orphanage and, and there was a stem of Saint, the Sacred Heart uh, Society in Cork as well. They were the adoption people and they went in looking for a little baby. So I think in that sense, they didn't know about me and I didn't know about them, about their experiences. But my experience with them was absolutely wonderful um, as I was growing up. I suppose one of the poignant things so far today is that my adopted mom uh, died when I was 12. And that had a huge impact on me because I spent unknowingly, I had lost my natural mom who I didn't know was alive at the time. And then I went on to uh, have severe loss after my adopted mom as well. So there was just me and my dad then, and he absolutely adored me and I adored him. And, you know, it was one thing that was prevalent was uh, when she died, there was a suggestion that I would be taken from him as a widower at the time and maybe go to another family. But he was very, very strong and advocated that I was going nowhere. So that to me was so, so important. And I did have a lovely childhood, that I will say. Can I ask you as well, Teresa, about something we heard at the very start? We heard your voice saying that you don't like to use the word home. And I think there are many others who have a similar view. Why is that? Absolutely. I think to me, um, home is a place of nurturing. It's a place of caring and it's a place of kindness in as much as possible. And I certainly know that there are a lot of homes who don't have that either. But I think definitely... There is something, there is no comparison between an institution and a home. We just cannot use the word home, even though our mums would have been, for some of the time in tune, they would have been put down as our companion. Sometimes we never saw them due to many different things that they were going through themselves and also the regime that they were going through. So what we call home is something in the heart. It's something in our souls and certainly we could not say that that was happening in an institution. Do you share that view, Peter? Yeah. Um, you do. Are you, are you hearing you, us there okay? I am now. Yeah. What was the question? Ah, that's great. Yeah, fire ahead. Pardon? Fire ahead there. I was just asking, do you share that view about the use of the word home? Because it wasn't a home. Certainly wasn't a home. Definitely not. It's an institution of, of, of the lowest type as far as I'm concerned, what was done to children there. They were packed into tune, uh, 300 babies screaming in there when there should be only 150. Why would the state not looking down what was going on there at little children that should be looked after, let go around naked and stark naked and dirtying themselves, no toilet training whatsoever. Like It was shocking. So that you couldn't call that a home. A home is, is where you're being respected, looked after, 
not neglected and starved. That's what the children are, even though I have, I have memory of this, but I've heard lots of stories. I came out of the tomb with very light, very small, pale, uh, not a clue of the outside world. When I see, look at my grandchildren and my children, what they have learned at that age, it's unreal. Mm. You eventually did find your birth mother, and it turns out that all the time when you were growing up, that her family actually weren't that far away. Correct. They were not. And uh, I was up, tried, rang the health board, the Western Health Board, to find out where I came from or where my parents was from, and they denied it. I had to wait at least 20 years to f get an idea more than 20 years to where um, I happened to find uh, uh, to my find my, where my mother came from. And when I did, I was so overjoyed with it. And they denied it and denied it. And the, when I found a bit of a file about my, my, myself, I discovered it was in three different documents, the address where my, my mother came from. I was denied all that until 1975 when I was looking to, to uh, more information of, of my mother. And uh, I went to the uh, UCHG and met with the, uh, the chaplain there and asked him, would he have um, any records of my mother or where she came or where I came from? So he, he turned around to me, Kathleen, to my wife, who were engaged at the time, and he saw the ring in her finger, and he says, he says to her, is it you that wants to know about uh, his, his mother? No, she says, it's not. So then he turned around and went off into an office and came out with a ledger. And then and he was no length gone, and here he comes out with the, the name and the address where my mother was from. So I headed to there and, and uh, I met up with, for the first time, I was must be 33 years at the time, met my uncle and my aunt. What an excitement and what excitement it would them to see me and to talk to me. And they always wished that I, they would bring me back to their home place, but they were afraid because when I was about 11 or 12 years of age, I was in the house where I was boarded out on. I was out doing the garden in the front of the house. And this man came cycling down the road on a bicycle, nice and slowly. And he, st he was staring in at me inside in the wind and he passed by. And he was able to tell me that day when I was got to the house about me, he knew about me. And he thought I was happy. I was only about 11 or 12. He thought I was happy there. So he did not intrude. He didn't want to upset me or anything because it started, like there was a big house where I was and it was a fine day and everything looked rosy. But little did he know what was going on behind those walls. They did not know until I told them, like, you know. And they were following my story up as much as possible. They saw me name on the local paper on a few occasions. I'd, I'd been involved in different things in the parish. And... Uh, it was grand to hear that, you know, that they were interested in getting me. You eventually did meet your mother. And I think it's fair to say that in common with many women who were sent to these institutions, she had a hard life. Hard is putting it very mildly, very mildly. Now, I found out from my uncle and aunt that day I was there, where she was. And I understood she was working in the Galway City. And this, I thought, that's not too bad. So they told me where to go to the McDonald Laundry. So I headed off and uh, got in myself one, one weekend. And we met with the Reverend Mother. And I explained my story and said who I was looking for. And she says to me, um, you won't be able to see her today. That was so disappointing. And she says, the next time you come, you will not look for your mother. You will say you're looking for your aunt and you will be her nephew. To this day, I cannot get my head around that. What was that about? Telling lies, that's all I can say. Telling lies, huge lies. Again, they want to keep us separated. But if I had to make arrangements then, 
to come in the following week, which we did. And we met her, we met up with her, and I was shocked to see what she looked, how she was dressed. But she looked at, she was only in her mid 60s, and she looked a woman in her 80s. When she, she was, when she died at 79, uh, and she, she never changed in her age, looked the very same as when I met her. The way she was dressed, the way her, way her hair was, you know, completely and utterly, utterly neglected, didn't, and did not want to speak. We were put into a small room, it's only about four by six foot area, and uh, we, uh, we met up with my mother there, and uh, the door was left wide open, so the conversation could be heard. That's the only thing, the reason I say that was done. But she wasn't able to speak to me, because when in there where she was working and slavery, they were not allowed to talk to one another. They were supervised by the nuns in all corners. If they were talking to another mate in there, uh, they would be chastised. So she did the same thing. She was afraid to talk to me or express our, 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 our feelings or anything. She just wasn't able. She was just, she was acting like a dummy to me, like, you know, and I was wondering why was that until I recognized the way there were treated in there. Mm. It's funny, I, I was actually talking to somebody not that long ago who was a child, was an altar boy, uh, helped to serve mass in the Magdalene Laundry in Galway. And it's his memory of being told not to talk to the women and that they weren't allowed to talk to him. And he says he looks back now and it's something that that, that has lodged in his head and he says it'll never go away. And he thinks about them a lot. And he's a man who I think is in his 70s now and it's it's just always there mm-hmm. um Teresa you also as you were saying to us found your mother your birth mother eventually but again it was a very very difficult process it was in the sense that I spent a long time looking for her you know I would have started looking for my mom we'll say in the 90, around 1987 88 just after having my first uh, born uh, son and I think just to just to speak about the birth for a minute, that when I had my son, I was absolutely terrified before I had my little baby, because the one thing was I had no background, I had no uh, genetic, or, you know, medical records, I hadn't anything, so I was really, really frightened about the whole thing. And just to say, I suppose, when I met my mom. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But there was one thing that I was very conscious of, that before I met her, I asked the social worker what she wore. Because if she wore a posh dress, I'd wear a posh dress. But if she wore a plain dress, then I'd wear a plain dress. And the reason I'm saying that is, I did not want her in any way to feel guilty, to feel that she had let me down, it, it, there was just something about respecting who she was and my very first time meeting her. And there was one very poignant moment, actually, when I did meet her was I had a very small photograph, the baby photograph for myself. And our photographs were taken in two mostly because we were destined to go to America. But I never I was supposed to go to America, but didn't get there for whatever reason. And hadn't she the very same identical photograph as well on the same day that I met her? And there was just something about putting the two photographs on the table at the same time. Because then I knew that I had found her. And it was absolutely overwhelming to meet her after all that length of time. And one thing as well was... She had never gone away. She had always been with me. She had always worried for me. She had been looking for me. And that's something I think that's very prevalent for today, actually, that I would be strongly saying for anyone that's out there looking for their mom, their dad, their siblings, never give up because I think they are looking for us too. And I think that's very, very important that we hold that space today. I know we're getting a lot of comments on Facebook and um, paying tribute to you both and also shocked at what you had to put up with in your very earliest years. I mean, people saying that the prisons 
would have been kinder in some ways. Um, by the way, anybody who's watching and who would like to get in touch, your comments, your questions are welcome via the Facebook page. Peter, to go back to yourself on another aspect of your story that just almost turns everything upside down, you discovered very late on that you'd had a sister who'd died in June. Well, thanks to Catherine Corliss when her research, she came up with the name on the register where the 796 babies was registered on. And she found a Mulrine there and the address fits into where my mother came from. She contacted me. I couldn't believe it that I had a sister as well. And was she the same as sister Marion Bridget, she was called. Then she was uh, 10 years younger than me now. She was, she was uh, on the records. She was born a healthy baby. Yes, in nine months, she had passed away. And the only information I, I a little bit I get was she died from convulsions or starvation. Now, I don't know where she is. I've been inquiring. I didn't mean the higher courts and that to look for her file. And I'm denied all that. I'm hoping she's not in that septic tank. I'm hoping she was sold off as bad and all says, and I'm watching out every chance for uh, to get a, a con get a contact from maybe America. She said she was if she ever get, well, if she is alive, and I hope she is alive because I have no chance if she's in that septic tank. What what a thing to a human being would do to another human being? It calls me. Why you wouldn't do it to a uh, any sort of an animal. You would not even dream of it. And they were religious uh, um, people. Like, why would they do that to a, a, a little innocent child and denied it was ever done? Teresa, can I ask you about that? I remember when a previous report came out about institutional child abuse, a, a friend of mine, his daughter, who was maybe six or seven at the time, said to him, like a serious little face on her, Daddy, why didn't they like children in the olden days? And it is very hard now, isn't it, to understand how this could have happened for so long? Yes, it is very, very difficult. I think... I always say whenever anyone asks me about anything that a baby is never a mistake. And I think that is something that has to be carried right through our lives for everybody because there was two different classes of society. We hadn't a hope from the time we were born really because of everything we've got the church, but the state and they have to be held accountable to the practices that were there at the time. But I think the most poignant thing of all is a mom being separated from her little baby and a baby being separated from their moms. And, and also there are dads out there who are looking as well. But it is a very, very difficult story to tell and to see the children of today asking the questions. This is why I think that the university and all of ourselves today, it is so important that we tell our children the true story of exactly what happened so that it does not repeat itself again. Only I think every one of us are very traumatized by it. We are living through it and we are doing our best from a very, very difficult place. I don't think there's any excuses. There's nothing I could say today that could make the institutional time that all settings in Ireland that we were in, there was nothing good about them. So it is very important that children know the truth and that they're nurtured into it, educated through it, and they are our youth. They are going to be the forebearers of what we went through. Peter, how did what you experienced as a child and as a young man, how do you think it's shaped your life? Because I suppose in talking to people about what we were doing today, a number of people I spoke to say they're, they're amazed by people like yourself and Teresa the energy you have and the commitment you have to trying to get to the truth, not just for yourself, but also for other people. Uh, it's, was, it's was awful de degrading. Like in society, we were nobody. I spent 70 years of my life thinking that I was nobody in society. And the church and state, 
seem to enjoy that. That's the, what they seem to want. And that's what they dished out to us. And it, it was all hard to be in lack of education, again, more disrespect, made sure we wouldn't be educated. And everything that could be to keep us down. But thank God, I think we came out on top. Now, uh, as I said, I, I was afraid to go public. I kept in my system for about 70 years and then I went public. And uh, I'm, it opened a new life for me. Like, I suppose, I got married in 1975 to Kathleen. And that was a, a great chapter in my life. At least somebody was having respect for me. And the children came along. Now I have a family, which I, I mean, while it seems, never thought I would have. And from there on, we have 12 grandchildren now. And uh, they are a joy to watch and to, to communicate with. And they communicate with me, which I thought, as I said already, I'd never in a way the same thought I would have anyone. And it was times then I said, before I ever got married or even thought about getting married, I said, I, won't, I don't think I'll get married. I don't want to have children because with what I went through, I wasn't going to put on to the next generation if it was to happen again. And that was my great fear. Mm. Teresa, the final report of the Mother and Baby Homes Commission has been delayed several times. I know it's due now in October. What are you hoping for? What would you like to see happening? Well, the first word that comes to my mind is accountability. I think that the report is very, very important. Again, I have to say I'm very disappointed, as many of us are, that it hasn't been out previously before now. So we wait with anticipation for October and I think the most important thing out of the report is that we will be made a high priority. I couldn't say that high enough in the sense of it is now the government's turn, it's the church's turn, it's that of the state, that they are going to elevate all of us from being the little ones that are interred underground to bring them overground. And I think the commission will be a template for going forward. The one most important thing is I do not want a situation where there's a report of over 2,000 pages sitting on desks all over the country. There has to be activation on it. There has to be accountability and responsibility. And I think the biggest thing that the Commission will do, I think, is that it will inform the public even more, again, stemming from today. And I think it's the public that will activate everything. They'll be on our side. They will challenge the governments. They will challenge the church. And I think that's what the commission is going to do. And I am hopeful about the commission. It's not before time, but I hope we'll be going into 2021 with a different Ireland and we will have a different place in society because we deserve it. Peter, what about you? What are you hoping for? Well, when I look back at 2015, it was, it was the start of this commission was set up. And in May uh, 2017, the remains of those, some of those children in that sewage was, was uh, recognised. And, and so it's, it's dated back to the time the mother and baby home was opened. Now, it's five, we it's five years going on. And yes, we're no wiser. We're told every so often, it's going to report is going to come out, it's going to come out. We don't know which October is going to come out. We still don't know. We're hearing it so often. And uh, I'm very disillusioned with, with the way it's carrying on. Put off was the smallest of ex excuse. Of course, the COVID thing, now the COVID thing is always going to be used as well to hold things up. And they're all just waiting for us to pass away nice and quietly so they won't have to answer to anybody. And this is what I see about it. Yeah, we're just denied again and denied us what we're, we're, we, the information we need to know. I want to know, is my sister in there or not? I want to move on move on in my life, the few years that I would have left. I want to know where she is. I want to see her. And uh, that's it. You know, we d I want a DNA done. I want the bodies of all that's in there put into a consecrated ground and show dignity and respect what we, they have not got since the, 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 the home started there. It's happened all over the country. I want us, everybody to be looked after and treated as normal citizens of this country. Listen, Peter and Teresa, thank you both so very much for your contributions. I mean, it really, 
I, I know there's there's people watching at the moment from various parts of the United States and from other parts of the world, and I think people really are very grateful to you for telling your stories and also for hopefully inspiring other people who find it very difficult to tell their stories and to talk about what happened to them either when they were children or when they were young women or young men, that they hopefully will, you know, if they want to, that they too will be able to find a place where they'll feel that they can tell their story and that the rest of us will listen to them. I want to thank you both very much. Thanks to, to Peter Mulrine and to Teresa O'Sullivan. The harrowing stories we were hearing there from the home, they've inspired many artists to resp respond creatively and most recently with the Stay With Me exhibition, which is now live on the Remembering Tomb Babies Facebook page. Dr. John Cunningham is now going to introduce to you two of the creative forces that are working part of the Tomb Oral History Project to discuss the value of the arts in highlighting these stories. And again, just a reminder that if you would like to take part in the conversation, you can do so by posting comments below. So John, I'm going to hand over to yourself. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, very uh, illuminating and interesting uh, so far. Uh, now, I have two tasks uh, to carry out in the next uh, quarter hour. In a few minutes, um, as Rachel said, I'll be talking to two people involved in the creative side of the project, uh, Miriam Houghton and uh, Elaine Feeney, uh, and they'll discuss how the creative arts can contribute to our knowledge and understanding of the Tomb Institution and uh, places like it. Uh, first of all, um, I want to talk a little bit uh, for a few minutes about the origins of the project uh, before we get to the main part uh, of the uh, of the discussion. So to um, to, um, to to um, look at the origins of the project, I have to go back to late uh, 2018 and the connections some of us had uh, with survivors and their advocates. Uh, firstly, with the Chewham Home Survivors Network, as it was called at the time. Called at the time. Now, through attending public events, uh, we learned that survivors were anxious to recount, to record, to disseminate uh, their experiences in ways that gave them control over the way that their own stories uh, were presented. They had spoken to the media, some of them, and to the Mother and Baby Homes Commission, uh, but these encounters weren't entirely satisfactory uh, from their point of view. So we began a consultation process uh, culminating um, in a one-day uh, workshop at NUI Galway in February 2019, uh, which involved survivors, uh, lecturers, some interested students, artists in uh, several media, and importantly, uh, archivists from the university. Uh, these are the people who will be looking after the recordings and the documents uh, in the um, coming uh, decades on behalf of us all. Our purpose then and now uh, was to inform the Irish public and also, I suppose, to affect the way that Irish history is taught at all levels of the education system. As a historian myself, who uses the approach of history from below, I can say that the testimony uh, that we've arch archived uh, so far, full life stories, um, shed a valuable light on 20th century Ireland not just on the institution in Tuam, on welfare systems, on church-state relations, but in the way that the various agencies impacted on communities, on families and individuals. And indeed, uh, the engagement with uh, public bodies, as has been uh, su suggested by, our, uh, 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 by, um, by Peter um, uh, there a few months ago, um, uh, continues to be challenging uh, for survivors. Uh, for me, uh, as well, um, the project uh, so far advances our understanding of the interplay between property, social class, religion and uh, respectability in Ireland. Now, um, in getting the show on the road, uh, we were assisted by the Galway University uh, Foundation, as Sarah Ann said, uh, which granted the project uh, and uh, given us the time, therefore, uh, to um, and the resources. Uh, to do things properly. Uh, but time and resources notwithstanding, our work was interrupted like everybody else's was uh, by COVID-19 and that's why we're here today and uh, not in the physical university. It was also why we had to suspend interviews for a while. Now in recent weeks uh, we have resumed the work 
carrying out a number of socially distanced interviews and a few interviews indeed over Zoom. Uh, so today we're encouraging survivors and their family members out there to make contact with us through our new website to arrange interviews in safe and comfortable uh, conditions. Uh, we also want to make contact with others who have any connection with the uh, Chewham institution, whether through living in the town of Chewham or thereabouts, whether uh, through involvement in the fostering process or indeed in any other way. So that's all I have to say for the moment. Uh, so I'll uh, introduce Elaine Feeney and Miriam uh, Houghton. Uh, first, I'll talk to Elaine. Um, uh, Elaine Feeney. Elaine is a poet and novelist, and she teaches creative writing at NUI Galway. Elaine, you are a pioneer of the project, and you've thought a lot about uh, how creative engagement uh, can deepen society's understanding of Chewham and other places, and you have uh, plans and so on um, uh, for, 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 for the coming uh, months. So maybe you could talk a bit about, about those plans and about how you see things, Elaine. Hi, John. Um, thanks very much. And to Miriam as well. I think uh, just listening to Peter and Teresa's stories really um, hammers home, I suppose, the absolute power of telling your story and storytelling and what role we can play to support uh, both Peter and Teresa and all of the survivors of Toome and the broader community. Um, I've been teaching in Toome actually for 20 years as well. So this this project is very close to me and I think that the creative ideas that we have is to move away maybe from artists appropriating the stories and to hear from the survivors and to publish uh, their works yeah and to publish their story yeah and uh, so we're hoping to create a, an actual like a physical book of both the first person accounts of the stories and also to get some contemporary writers and artists to respond to the stories of the survivors and that they can work closely with them and that we can hear the first person um, narrative accounts. I think it's, it's, it's very important. You know, as Teresa said, the importance of the youth knowing about this is, is key to the survivors telling their stories and that we can learn from the mistakes of the past and, and the horrors. I mean, those, both Peter and Teresa, that was so affecting. And I think it needs to be opened out to a broader community. And I think that that's where both Miriam and I see the creative aspect of this project, opening it out into schools um, and, and into learning from the past. Thanks, Elaine. We'll uh, come back and I'll just see if there are any uh, questions in a few mo moments. Uh, but um, I want to go to uh, Miriam now. So uh, Dr. Miriam Houghton is a lecturer in theatre and drama and at NUI Galway and she's uh, directing a theatrical production on the Chewham Institution in the next academic uh, year. Uh, Miriam, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm going to try, John, um, even though COVID has severely disrupted <laughs> um, our plans, but we're going to forge ahead. And I also just want to say, listening to Teresa and Peter, I'd heard their stories before and I've heard the podcast, but there's nothing so powerful as hearing people tell their own stories. Um, and it's really difficult to listen to it, but we have to listen to it. Um, and so that's exactly why we're here. So I just want to say I'm really pleased to be here today virtually, but I really look forward to when I can be with everyone physically to talk about this. And I think the last few months have made a few things absolutely clear for all of us. We need live encounters. We need to be together and to share our stories. We need to remember and we need to respect those who are no longer with us. And while oxygen may make us breathe, I think being together as a community makes us human. And for me, that is what performance does. It reminds us that we're alive and it reminds us that coexistence is our greatest asset. And at times, particularly these times, it's our greatest challenge. I don't underestimate the public health risks that we currently face. But when I get up in the morning, I remind myself if Shakespeare can write King Lear during the plague, by God, we'll produce this performance during COVID. Um, but hopefully it, it'll happen in spring. So we should have moved along a bit, I hope. Our thinking in terms of how to actually create this production is to respond directly to the testimonies that yourself and Sarah Ann and Mary and other historians are taking. 
from survivors or from family members or from the community. We want to use the testimonies as our core material to create an artistic response. And I'll direct and produce it, but there's a huge team involved. Um, it's very much a collaborative effort. So drama and theatre studies at NUI Galway is providing a lot of support. Uh, we also have Dr. L Putnam, who's a lecturer in digital media and who is a performance artist involved. Um, also, uh, our own Elaine Feeney, who we've just heard from, is going to come and do some work with us around poetry and language and creative writing. Uh, professor Lillis O'Leary, a professor of Irish and an extremely well-known, established Shanno singer, is going to be involved musically and sing us a few songs. Um, so it's really exciting, and um, I suppose the cross, the, the support right across the university, but also outside of the university, we will be working with Anu Productions, and um, they would be Ireland's leading theatre company that deal with testimonies and archives in really difficult and sensitive situations. And many people might have seen their work throughout the decade of centenary. So they're going to come in and do workshops with us around uh, the use of testimony uh, and the use of archive for performance. Um, and also to survivors listening or family members listening, we would love survivors or family members or community members to be involved or to give us feedback. And um, we hope to come to tune with the students, with the drama students and the digital media students and meet everyone. And um, we want to get their feedback. We want people to feel involved in this production, that it's their production and that it's something that they can feel proud of down the line. And um, I'd also like to highlight we won't try and create any type of documentary. It's not a documentary play. It won't have a beginning, middle and end. This history isn't resolved. And there's no way you can put on a production and say, we're going to represent the voice of every single person who is connected to this institution and this history. That's impossible to achieve. So I wouldn't dare uh, pretend that we could, um, particularly for the little children who are no longer with us. But we will create an artistic response that highlights the experiences as best we can, that responds to the experiences and that contributes to a legacy um, that's part of our research, part of our teaching, part of our thinking every day. And we know that we're dealing with trauma. We know it's intergenerational trauma. We know the pain and the secrecy of this history has marked many generations. And we will not shy away from any of that. But our central focus is to create a production that responds to the survivor stories, to respond through dance, through the body, through performance art, through theatrical scenes, poetry, music, uh, to use every medium, digital media that we can um, to create a production um, that captures and respects the stories of survivors. Uh, so that's our intention. And one way or another, we'll, we'll find a way to make it happen. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, th thanks, uh, Miriam. Um, Elaine, um, you envisage um, having writers maybe work with uh, survivors uh, should they wish to do so? Yeah, so any of the survivors, as, as Miriam said, we hope that the, you know, that the archive records the first person narrative and then we are going to start a project this coming autumn where contemporary writers, we will be inviting contemporary writers to work with survivors that wish to work with a contemporary writer and that the writer would respond to the story to the individual story in whatever way they see fit to their own genre, be it poetry, fiction, and that also that we publish the account of the first person's uh, survivor account as well. And we also hope that that will lead into um, a transition year project for schools, John, so that there'll be a, a project that can, we can roll out in schools, use the book as central to this, but also that we can learn from intergenerational pain and in areas around consent, uh, social justice, and that um, it will be a really important project within the transition year, uh, year in schools. And I think, um, as Teresa said, to echo what she said, it is really important that we learn from these stories. And I think we need to do that through art, through writing, through storytelling, through uh, drama, like Miriam said, um, site specific drama also and projects which you know it, it, it we have a very ambitious focus for this project but we really want the survivors to be central to the response to their stories so that they can feel ownership um, it's very clear that their voices haven't been heard that it hasn't reached the people that they wanted to reach that it hasn't you know we we've heard of tune but 
we need it collected and the archive is one way, but what can we do for these survivors and for the broader community at Tum? So we're also looking towards um, ideas for community outreach as well and you know different ways that we can actually bring bring some sort of a positivity as well regarding the telling of these stories in what we can learn and in how we can you know uh, uh, d deliver this to the broader community so um yeah so the the idea of working with the contemporary writers is definitely to I suppose avoid that idea of appropriating the stories, but at the same time, I've spoken to some of the survivors who have said that it is key to them that their story is remembered and that anyone who's willing to tell it or talk about it or uh, creatively interact with it, it's really important to them because they feel maybe that they are, that, that it makes them more of a valued citizen. And I think that has come up earlier in the earlier uh, talk that they don't feel that they are part of society like other people have been, which is a really um, tragic and a great tragic stain on the state, I think, and it's, it's, it's appalling. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Miriam, uh, your students will be involved in the project. Um, you, were, um, you, you, you expect that they'll get something out of that? I think this will be a transformational experience for the students. I mean, when you're talking about drama students, you're I'm not talking maybe about the traditional idea of a student. Sometimes, as you know, we have trouble getting students to class. With drama students, we have trouble sending them home. And um, <laughs> they would be, you know, addicted to the stage um, and, and incredibly passionate people. Um, empathy is something that I feel a lot of people who work in the arts or theatre value or understand at a very core level, which probably attracts them to working in that field in the first place. But this, it won't just be an option for them to participate. The students who are involved are doing so as part of assessed coursework. So as part of the rehearsal process, they will have lectures uh, from you, John, <laughs> and Sarah Ann and other people I'm sort of dragging in um, around the history. And um, there will be the site visit to Tume and hopefully interactions with Tume survivors, if that works, if that's safe and appropriate. And um, there will be different levels of skill development in terms of digital media. Uh, in terms of dance, performance art, theatrical scenes, and they will be devising and creating these scenes in response to the testimonies and the archives um, that they're dealing with. Um, and then afterwards, they'll follow up, of course, with um, critical analysis uh, and written assessment around the production. So it's going to be very intense, um, but it will be something, I think, that stays with them long term about what it is what it means to work in theatre, what it means to work in the arts, what it means to have access to public space and invite an audience to come and engage with you. And in terms of deciding where you put your energies, which stories do we need to tell? Um, and this is a story that has to be told and retold because it has been told. And I think as Elaine and as everyone has, has mentioned, maybe isn't having the effect we necessarily, those stories necessarily should be having in terms of the state and in terms of response. Um, and so this will be one element, the theatrical production will be one element of this project, which has many elements in which we invite a, a dialogue with everyone and anyone who wishes to be involved and, and come and see it. Um, Elaine, you'd have similar ambitions, I suppose, uh, with regard to the materials that will be generated for uh, transitional year programmes, would you, in terms of the impact on on, on the yeah, people. absolutely. I am uh, talking about, they spoke earlier about Killian Murphy's role in the project and, and narrating the podcast. He said recently on radio show with John Kelly that empathy is simply to listen. And I think that that's really important that we start to teach empathy constructively in schools. And I think that Tum is a really good uh, way in maybe into you know, discovering how we can do that and how we can, uh, you know, bring this into the classroom. Um, I think it will be challenging because I think that the story is particularly harrowing. And I think that um, everybody feels a great deal of shame around this uh, trauma. But I think that it needs to be told. And as Miriam said, told and retold and that we do need to learn from the past. And that if we can use these stories going forward in schools with uh, young people, that 
that these that the survivors may feel in some way that they are being listened to and now they're actually being heard. Um, and you also said there, John, yourself as well, about history, I suppose, from the bottom up, to put it crudely, and I don't mean that with any disrespect, but as a history and English teacher, I think that the history course has been really heavily um, uh, full of, of men for, for the last 20 years that I've been teaching it, 90% of the junior search history course, the people in history, and I've written extensively about this. We, we need to hear the voices of the women and of the children and social history is extremely important. It, it is to me, um, one of the most important uh, components of, of the history course is the social history. Um, and I think that, yeah, and I think that we need absolutely. to really value these stories and that we need to, they need to be more part of the curriculum. And I would really be ambitious for this side of the project that actually that this is a very, very important project for transition year schools. And I would be hoping that we will at some stage get a buy-in from the Department of Education, but maybe that's very ambitious, but that would be my ambition for the project. So um, that we would really uh, bring it into schools and bring it into schools and roll it out on a national level. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Elaine. We're running out of time, I think, but uh, I'll finish by, with a, a question, brief question maybe uh, to Miriam. Um, Elaine mentioned that history in the schools has been about men. I know there's in uh, the area of theatre and drama, this has uh, been brought to light as well in the last uh, number of uh, years, is that so? So do you think um, anything, uh, work of this nature uh, can help to uh, redress uh, the balance uh, somewhat? John, I have so many thoughts about gender and politics and theatre and history. I don't know how I would squeeze them in. <laughs> and I don't want to detract from the main the main focus, which is the Tume Institution and the yeah. Tume Oral History Project. But absolutely, theatre is about visibility. Theatre is about bodies on stage. Theatre is about using the performers, using the space to channel through energies, which are always historical in a sense. All our stories are coming from somewhere, whether it's the recent past or a long, long time ago. Um, and a lot of what theatre does and a lot of what Irish theatre is excellent at is challenging traditional ideas of power and um, challenging problems of the past. Look at uh, some of the biggest voices in Irish theatre and that's what you'll find. They weren't telling comforting little stories to send you to sleep. They were saying there's big issues in our society and in how we treat each other as humans. Um, and th that's where the real power of Irish theatre and a lot of art in Ireland is. And so, of course, we will be inspired by that space. Um, and our students will, of course, be learning uh, throughout the course of the rehearsal period about the patriarchal um, and, and oftentimes deeply sexist and deeply mis misogynistic elements of Irish society. Um, that has to be confronted head on. We can't shy away from that. If you try and dress it up or tone it down, you become complicit in, in the history, I think. Thanks. I think, uh, thanks to uh, both of our uh, panellists here, um, Elaine and Miriam. Uh, very interesting and insightful observations. I think uh, we've definitely run out of time now, and um, it's my uh, job to hand over uh, to Sarah Ann, I think, who's uh, coming along uh, after. Thank okay, you, so Sarah. Thanks, Miriam. thanks John, um, and thanks to Elaine and Miriam, who are two of our project team members. Uh, the only two that we are missing uh, today from this podcast is Mary, Mary Cunningham, who is one of our interviewers, and Dr. Barry Houlihan. Um, I get the, uh, the job, the, the excellent, I suppose, privilege to um, interview uh, the next speakers. I'm going to introduce them one by one. The theme of this panel is children's rights and survivors' rights today and historically. So first, I, I, I need very little introduction here. Um, if uh, Catherine Corliss um, is the researcher and historian who really broke the story of Tume in, in 2014 and has remained very much uh, a voice and an advocate when it comes to survivors' rights and when it comes to uh, the state's role, I guess, in, in dealing with survivors. So I'm just seeing um, if we have Catherine there. Okay, I might actually jump to Keelan Hogan. Are you there, Keelan? Do we have? 
No? Okay. I can see I have Pat Donan and Colonel Faherta. So I'm going to move around this order. And Pat, I'm going to come to you first. Um, one of the main requests we've had on Facebook has been when Killian Murphy will be appearing. Now, we have responded that obviously Teresa and Peter are the stars. Um, but people can listen to uh, Killian, who has narrated the podcast. But Pat, one of the big points of this project has been that uh, we don't repeat past mistakes. So part of this is that we need to involve younger people. So I know that the youth as researchers is a really big part of this. Could you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, sure, Sarah. I suppose uh, at a couple of different levels, um, the Youth as Researchers project, which is, was, was founded at NUI Galway in, in our centre by myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Daniel Kennan, operates on the belief that um, young people not alone should have a voice. And Peter and Theresa very clearly have shown us in a human way how children remain voiceless. Uh, the Youth as Researchers initiative is where young people have a chance to do some research, be trained as researchers, do research on an issue that they are passionate about, and then uh, complete that research and produce a research video, which is taught in schools as part of an empathy curriculum education program, which we've instigated at the centre in NUI Galway. So it's very much about young people's uh, voice. And, um, examples of things that they have they have looked at in the past which are, are available and which Killian Murphy who's patron of our centre narrates on which does get great visibility for young people's voices are all situated around issues of empathy and the one thing that really screamed out at me listening having looked listened to the podcast and been involved in them uh, and what I really learned from Chris Carroll and learned from Peter and Teresa is that human empathy in Irish civic society is the key, the key ingredient that was missing for them in very real and human ways and is missing now. And the whole idea of youth as researchers is really is to give life to empathy uh, in, in very tangible ways. And the way we do that is that they bring up issues that are key to them in their lives. And we're looking at how uh, young people, particularly on the Tune project, fr drawing from the expertise of the survivors, uh, how they can translate uh, the stories of Tomb for future generations into a Youth as Researchers project, which will be a, a very clear, narrated, uh, succinct video uh, when, once we produce it. And I know from day one, when we, in February last year, it was the, the constant request was that this be, this be worked on by, by younger people. Um, so I think that's really relevant. And as we've kind of tried to, to point out, TUM is one of a number of institutions. It just happens to be one because of, for many reasons, that has gotten international attention. So it, it is for us a, an important study because it raises so many issues. But I know in your work, Pat, as a UNESCO chair, there, there's also an interest within UNESCO in highlighting these types of stories, isn't there? Yeah, I've had discussions with colleagues in UNESCO in Paris, and one of the um, plans we have, uh, I mean, UNESCO has, uh, as it was founded at the end of World War II, uh, ironically at a time when the displacement of children was one of the huge factors that led to its creation and the creation of UNICEF. But one of the components that UNESCO does is that it, it ensures that memory and uh, heritage uh, are, are preserved. And heritage is not just, it is buildings, but it is not just buildings. And um, if you look at the UNESCO's track record on uh, ensuring that the, uh, that the memory of the Holocaust is survived or survives on an ongoing basis is key. And from my discussions with uh, a number of the survivors of Tomb, <clears throat> most notably Chris Carroll, who's a friend of mine, um, they've all said that they want the, and Peter and Teresa, I'm sure, would agree with this, that they want the story not to be forgotten. Their story should never, ever be forgotten. And uh, UNESCO are very interested, uh, obviously, 
in our Youth as Researchers program. And we have a commitment from them that we will have an event in Paris where we will hope to bring at least some of the survivors uh, of Tomb to come and uh, commemorate and uh, not just their memory, but future uh, protection of uh, civic society, knowing what was done to them and what happened. And what I really like about this opportunity is that it will be intergenerational. And um, and as as uh, we know from the podcast, Killian Murphy is very committed to this. And as a great friend and patron, Killian has agreed to participate in the the project in Paris. And um, from a conversation myself and Elaine Feeney had very recently, one of the ways we're thinking about doing this commemoration um, development of a youth as researchers project would be to work with schools in Tuam. And how brilliant would it be, how ironic would it be, but how brilliant would it be that we come full circle on uh, having the very sources of the harm to children be the sources of preserving the memory to those children. Thanks, Pat. Uh, stay where you are as well. I'll be back to the panel in a minute. Um, we have Catherine Corliss, I believe. I'm going to... Can you hear me yeah. okay? Good. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I lost you there for a while. Oh, don't worry. We we have people ready to go. So um, good. Good. even in the virtual world. So Catherine, uh, you, you need very little introduction. Uh, your research um, obviously had, has had a huge effect internationally and on, on Irish history as well. But what has been your life experience since 2014 or what has happened since then? Oh, my goodness. Uh, in a few minutes, where will I start? Because um, 2014 was fantastic because uh, way before that, I'd been trying to get the story out and unfortunately, um, where I thought it would be uh, taken off my hands locally, but that didn't happen. And uh, it was only when the media got hold of it, as we know, that, uh, that all hell broke, broke loose and the story went worldwide. But uh, since then, um, it, I know that a good has come out of this, even though it, it was a terrible tragedy that I had to reveal because uh, it brought the likes of Peter and all the other uh, survivors forward because uh, they had nobody at the time. They had absolutely nobody to tell the story to. And above all, they were ashamed to tell their story or ashamed to be associated with the with the Tume institution, which we call it. And uh, it's only when when I started revealing what really went on that the mothers weren't to blame. From the research I had done, I had found out all, uh, quite a lot. And uh, I was, you know, when I told them that it's not your fault, it's not your mother's fault, it's, it's the state and the church. And they began to believe this and to give them a new sense of hope and courage to go forward. And uh, we met quite a lot over the first year or two. And uh, I noticed that they were coming out of themselves and that they were, they were getting the courage to do documentaries and to go, I mean, to sit in front of a camera and give their life story for, and knowing that this was going to be broadcast. So that's an absolute positive that came out of all this in the last few years. And I'm happy for that. And Catherine... I suppose a, a big part of what you've had to do since then also is just keep the message out there. And like the media have been been great in that way. They actually yeah. have, you know, helped yeah. you with that. I suppose a recent story was around uh, the Vatican and the questions yeah. around. The well, over the years, um, I, I, know, I, I noticed that the media were keeping this alive and I kept with the media. Uh, and um, but I, I just want to uh, congratulate yourselves as well on, on what you were doing because it's great to get those all those oral stories together because as we know the government have decided to put a lock on on all the survivor stories that they have and, and not reveal them for 75 years so that that's what i i felt that was a cruel thing to do but uh the fair play to the to the Galway university uh, you you have their stories now they will be open to the public and they will be open to anyone <coughs> who wants to find out the truth because the truth is everything and even, I was just wondering, with the other universities throughout Ireland, uh, they might consider doing the same thing. I mean, there's so many other areas, and there's Vesper, there's, there's Shanaras Abbey, there are homes in Dublin, uh, all over the country. And uh, perhaps they will take, uh, take note of what you have done, and which will mean that those stories will be out there. And also, I just want to say as well, there is such a fantastic empathy from you all here for the, in the last hour, listening to everyone. And there's such empathy and support for the survivors. And I just feel at this stage, 
um, I, I feel the government are, are, are more or less just uh, using everything as a cop out to, to prevent this uh, final uh, report coming out. And it's heartbreaking because it started, it was supposed to come out in uh, 2017, then it went on to 18, then 19, and then, and now again, we don't know where we are. As Peter said, we don't know, as he said, he put it well, what October is coming out. So I feel uh, um, pressure works with the government because if there's no fuss, if everything goes quiet, they will leave, they will leave that report there. They won't bother with it. They're already indicating that, they're, that the DNA will would probably be uh, delayed in, uh, indefinitely. Now that is to me is a cop out as well. But what I feel listening to everyone there for the last hour is that um, if we could harness all the positivity, all the empathy and all the love there is for those tomb babies and the other babies throughout Ireland who weren't allowed a life, if we could harness that and maybe my suggestion is each and every one of you and your friends and your family um, a letter, an email to Micheál Martin, to uh, Minister for Children, Roderick O'Gorman. I mean, pressure works on the government to say we're out here, we're not going away. We want this final report on the 31st of October. We don't want it sitting on your desk for another three months. We want action now. Uh, people mightn't realise, but uh, as regards to and the excavations, um, because from the fifth interim report last April, it has been stated that tomb must be excavated, that they were buried illegally. And I mean, that's more or less in my mind done and dusted. We shouldn't have to wait for the Commission of Inquiry's final report. That came out in the summary of the fifth interim report, that tomb must be excavated. And I mean, you, you mentioned the Vatican there and, and they are behind us because um, first of all, um, Archbishop Neary, Michael Neary of tomb, he mentioned back in 2017 when the remains were found and it was proven that they were the tomb babies. Um, he mentioned that yes, he, he would be for excavation that, and that the sisters, the once poor sisters, he more or less said that they, they, they should take responsibility. And uh, when he stated that then, I just wrote to him two weeks ago, I wrote to Archbishop Michael Leary and I asked him, is, does, is he still of the same mind that he backs the, uh, the tomb babies must be excavated and reinterred. And he said, yes, I am of the same mind. So then I wrote to the papal nuncio, uh, um, uh, Archbishop Ocolo, and he very kindly stated the same remark. I mean, uh, Archbishop, uh, the papal nuncio is the voice of the Holy See, and they are behind us. So I, uh, I have let the government know that as well. So it's pressure, we need, we need government know that we are not going away and we are also planning a uh, march at the end of September in Tume again because uh, we need to let the government know we are here and we are not going away and we need this final report this year. So thank you all again for this evening, uh, all those events and highlights, all the mother and baby homes in Ireland and, uh, and their cause. Thank, thanks Catherine, I, I might come back to you in a minute. Um, okay. You've just raised there. So one of the uh, reports, I suppose, that was quite interesting um, last December, and I'm going to come to 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 Caitlin on this. Um, they they revealed that there was actually, you know, 100. And it was the Sunday Business Post article. 192,000 women and children had gone through the county homes and the mother and baby homes. And Caitlin, your your book, Republic of Shame, dealt with many institutions, not just the institution in Tume. So I might get you to talk about that, but in particular, um, there's one mother, uh, Rose McKinney, who was in tune twice. And can you tell us a bit about her experience? Because I think it's really important. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarana, for having me and, and Catherine for all your work. And I think this is just such an important project. And I would never want to speak on behalf of a survivor, but uh, Rose is a woman I met. Um, she was protesting at one of the protests in Dublin. I think she's 81 now. She lives in Dublin and she is a surviving mother who was sent to tomb twice. And I worked with Rose to try and get access to her records. She really wanted to have her documents to prove what had happened and, you know, to have her information. She was only a teenager when she became pregnant the first time. She was around 17. She had left school at 13. She's from Dunmore in Galway. So 
uh, her family had a farm and she worked on the farm from a very young age. And so she wouldn't have known uh, about pregnancy or what was happening to her body. I think the first time she realized she was pregnant was when she went into labor. And she was sent to the Tum home as she had her son there. She was not allowed to hold him other than during feeding times. Uh, it was, you know, a very um, difficult time that she spent there. And her son was eventually fostered out, but she didn't really know what had happened to him. She doesn't remember giving any consent. We later found when we did access her records that her family had actually been paying uh, I think it was 30, 30 shillings a month uh, for the upkeep of her son. And I think in many ways, this was a condition for women to leave the institution was that their, their family had to pay. It's something that I don't think people realize that families were often paying money to the council or to the nuns uh, for the, the upkeep of children in this institution. And I think it makes the death rates in that home even more shocking that you know the institution was receiving money both from the state but also from families of these women. Um, she was then sent back again a second time when she was pregnant with her daughter. And this time it was a, a boyfriend. It was actually a man who wanted to marry her and uh, I think proposed, but there was so much shame and so much stigma at the time that it wasn't allowed and she was sent to the institution. The father of the child actually visited her in Tum uh, and she said the nuns allowed him to see her, but they wouldn't let him see his daughter. So I think that's often a narrative that men sort of abandoned women and it did happen. But this was a man who actually wanted to be a father and wanted to, to see his daughter and he wasn't allowed. The second time that she was in Tum, she didn't go home. She was sent to the Magdalene Laundry in Galway by the nuns. And the process of trying to access her records, we actually had to apply to the Mercy Sisters directly for the records that they held about the laundry. So we couldn't go through, um, you know, a normal FOI to uh, one of the government departments. We had to apply to the same order of nuns who had incarcerated her in Galway. And the only thing we received back was a single line from a ledger that said uh, her name, her age, uh, it listed her address as Tum, so only as the institution, not her home address. It had the names of two nuns that presumably authorized her to be sent there. And then under cause, the only words were twice penitent, penitent twice. So the reason in black and white written in the nuns own records was that she had had two children outside of wedlock. And she was treated as a penitent. She was treated as an offender. And, you know, Peter has spoken about his mother's own experience. Many women were sent from the Tum Institution to the Magdalene Laundry in Galway, and some never left. Rose actually escaped with another woman after quite a long time in what she called the most vicious place you could imagine. Uh, she lost hearing in one of her ears from being hit by one of the nuns while she was there. She escaped, the, the guards were sent after her uh, to her home in Dunmore, but she remembers her, her dog was there and, and her sisters and brothers and they wouldn't let her be taken back. So um, she did escape that laundry. She, uh, she then moved to Dublin. But, you know, she is someone still alive today who experienced that institution firsthand, whose children uh, were taken from her and the difficulty in trying to access that basic information um, I think is really uh, shocking that, you know, it, without help and without resources, it's very difficult for survivors to access their own records. And I think now in the and I know that some of the survivors from Tume have, have gotten their records uh, recently from uh, Tusla due to work by advocates, um, uh, really. But uh, for many survivors of all the institutions, that question of First of all, even if you find out where to go, then you try to petition to get access. And then if you're blocked even once, it's it's going to have a, a detrimental effect, really. And I think that's why some of the calls for a national archive of social care records, but also trained people like genealogy, people who can assist survivors to find their own story. This is really where we need to be going, isn't it, in regards to, to this? 
I mean, it was several different institutions that we had to apply for. And, and also the, the note about the, the payments that her family made, that was only an archivist in Galway who helped us out and had a look at what's called the manager's orders. So we didn't even get that through the application to Tusla for records. That was a completely separate sort of informal request that we were lucky enough to get that information. And that was really important for her to know. You know, that was something that showed that her family had paid money and, and tried to support. And, and so, I, I think yeah. I, I read an interview, um, I think in, in The Sun with Rose and part of her discussion was around the closure of the home. And she kind of described that some of the women actually just left uh, in 61. But do you want to talk a bit about that, the, the, the final closure of the Tume Institution? Well, I think talking about records and I think there are a lot of records that are publicly available. And when I was working on the book, I went back over some of the county council records around the time that the home was closing, the institution was closing. And you can see county councillors debating about whether they should close the institution or not. And from 1951, the institution was described as a fire trap by one of, I think it was the county managers. There was concerns about the safety and the conditions of that institution a decade before it closed. And yet there was constant resistance and pushback to actually closing the institution. It only closed in the end because it would cost the state more to renovate it to a, an acceptable living standard for vulnerable women and children than it would be to send them to Sean Ross Abbey, which was considered, you know, uh, appropriate and yet was a place where more than a thousand children died. Um, so that's what happened to the women and children who were still there in Tum in 61. They were sent off to other institutions, not only Sean Ross, but uh, at least one child was sent to an asylum in Ballinasloe and died shortly after being transferred. So, you know, the, the sort of accountability of where these children were sent after the institution closed is of great concern. But uh, there was a senior... Um, there was a TD, a Finnefall TD, uh, Mark Kilalea Sr., who argued that they should not close the institution in Tum because the county has the benefit of the money spent there. And this is a direct quote from those records. So this was around the time it was being debated. So the economics of it were always a concern. It didn't close because people thought it was a terrible thing to keep children within an institution like this. It closed because it was too expensive to renovate it or to, to repair it. And also there was resistance against closing it because uh, TDs and, and county councillors were worried about losing the money that was apparently coming in um, while the institution was still running. And I think that's really important to realize. And when I was reporting the book, like you said, I was investigating other institutions and one of the institutions that the commission is investigating is the castle, a place called the castle in Donegal. And I'd never heard about it. And I really couldn't find anything about it. Um, in, in sort of public information about it. So I went to this small town called Newtown Cunningham. And it turns out that this institution only opened in the 80s and operated until 2006. So I was around 17 at the time. Uh, and this was just this was really shocking that there was a mother and baby home operating in Ireland in 2006 and I made an FOI request got the records that you know the health board had from that time and it showed a very similar process where the institution was in disrepair I think there was a hole in the roof and um, there was concerns about whether it was fit for human habitation and there's still women and children in this institution at the time uh, and it closed because it was in disrepair I again in 2006 not because it was considered wrong that women were being sent to an institution to hide away while they were pregnant because of the stigma that was still ongoing thanks a million I, i'm going to come back to the whole panel near the end we've had lots of questions in um Grania blair makes the the very important point that uh, interviewers need to be trained and of course, like oral history and the, the, the training that that needs is critical here. And um, myself, John and Mary, you know, that's such a huge part of this for us. But it's a really important point for us to, to remember. And on these uh, networks, and I'm going to go to Conal for this, the question of networks, how all these institutions are connected. You've been writing about adoption for 10, 12 years You've been writing about illegal registrations. Um, 
what what's your thoughts here uh <laughs> yeah um well i suppose i initially started writing about forced and illegal adoption um you know from i started in 2009 and i initially started writing about saint patrick's guild um and the more i wrote the more i realized you know i need to start telling this a different way and you know i was writing it through shall we say individual experiences so i wrote about Tressa Reeves and she was the victim her son was a victim of an illegal birth registration and she actually just settled a case against the state last summer but the more I wrote about that the more I realized you know St. Patrick's Guild was a cog in a wheel um, you know Toome is a cog in a wheel Vesper is a cog in a wheel that you can't write about one of these institutions without understanding all of them that they're all interlinked um, and it's the same with the Magdalen Laundries you know we tend to isolate all of these stories as individual scandals. So, you know, we had the the Magdalene Laundries, we started looking at them, well, the state started looking at them in 2011, and we had an apology in 2013. And I remember writing in 2013, you know, that eventually we're going to we're gonna get to adoption, we're going to get to mother and baby homes, because these are all the same cohort of people who the state was siphoning off, essentially, a service that they weren't willing to provide for single mothers or children or people that were just simply poor um, and that the religious were doing it by hiding these people away because they didn't fit a social ideal of the time. So the more I started to understand that, the more I started to maybe move away from looking at uh, telling individual stories and trying to tell maybe a systemic story through a case or through records. And that's when I started to really go after records. And the more you see as Caelan said there, you know, you could access a record that tells you something about St. Patrick's Guild, but there's a reference to a doctor or a reference to a priest, a reference to a Magdalene Laundry or a woman going from, uh, you know, a mother and baby home or even a, indeed an adoption agency ending up in a mother and baby home. So you understand that all of these institutions are linked and that essentially how we understand them is to do with narrative and that's to do with how the state tends to want to control that narrative or put that narrative out there. And that's really how I view this is, is that, you know, if you, if you look at, I mean, I, I wrote about a cabinet memo, a memo to government when they set up the, uh, what became the McAleese investigation or committee into the Magdalene laundries. And at that time concern was expressed. This is 2011. So this is before, you know, the wider public had heard of Toome or had heard of Vesper or had heard of even mother and baby homes. You know, the, 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 it wasn't in the public sphere. Um, the cabinet at that meeting privately expressed concern that if we start looking at Magdalene laundries, we're going to have to start looking at mother and baby homes. We're going to have to start looking at foster care settings. We're going to have to start looking at psychiatric institutions and the treatment of women in them. Now, ironically enough, we have a state inquiry into mother and baby homes, which happened four years later. We also have a range of inquiries into foster care settings in Ireland. So once I started to learn that, I started to see this was essentially a way of limiting a story. So the state would say, we'll we look at the Magdalene Laundries and it's Magdalene Laundries for a number of years. Now we're looking at mother and baby homes. Eventually we'll get to, I hope, psychiatric institutions. But adoption is a thread that runs through all of them. Um, and it's a similar case with even the illegal registrations. I mean... In 2018, the, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs had a, a huge press conference to announce the illegal birth registration scandal, you know, that they discovered all of these records. I mean, I had documented cases of illegal birth registrations from St. Patrick's Guild, you know, the best part of a decade earlier. I mean, in writing, where the nuns had actually openly admitted that this has happened and that in multiple cases, um, you know, they've been in the news, St. Patrick's Guild, since, you know, 98. Um, so again, I think there's a big difference between what's a public scandal in Ireland and what's a scandal and when the state is aware of things and when the public is aware of them. And I think the state tends to focus on limiting public knowledge of these institutions. And the best way to do that is to kind of break them down into individual scandals and focus on specific aspects of how these places operated. So we might look at infant mortality and look less at um, the treatment of women or adoption um, or else we look specifically at mother and baby homes, but yet not look at women who maybe ended up in, you know, private nursing homes. Like, for example, Tressa Reeves had the exact same experience as a woman who might have been in Toome or in Bespera who lost her child to adoption. But yet she's excluded from the current inquiry because she doesn't fit 
the, the, the very tight description of that she wasn't in a mother and baby home, but she had the exact same experience. Um, and that to me is all about how the state looks at limiting how we understand these things. I mean, I, I found a record in uh, the Cork County Archive. Um, there's a letter from the Parliamentary Secretary to Dr. Con Ward, who was the, I think, Minister for Local Government at the time, from 1945. And they had a, he had expressed concern about an 82% infant mortality rate. In a, that's 70 years before Catherine was, was, you know, bringing all of these issues to light to the world. And at that point, the, the point was made that the minister didn't want a public scandal to emerge from this. So in 1945, the Irish state was worried about infant mortality in these institutions. And it took us the best part of, you know, 70, 75 years for it to come to light in, in modern Ireland. So I think that's how I understand these issues. That's how I view them. And I think when you see it in the round in that way and you understand that all of these issues are part of the same story, it says a lot more about the Irish state and how it was constructed and how it was founded um, and perhaps the misogyny at the centre of it um, than we'd like to understand. You know, I know one of the earlier speakers mentioned, you know, we tend to view Irish history from, or shall we say official Ireland tends to view Irish history from the perspective of men and heroic Ireland. And yet so many of these women did more for the cause of, of, of women and were totally unheard, were silenced. Um, and in many cases, as we know, paid with their lives. Conal even answered his two questions in one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was, I wouldn't have stopped that for a million years. And <laughs> I think, I suppose we, we only have a few minutes left and I, I want to kind of go back to everyone, but on that, I guess, note, so a big issue here as, as it's coming through this panel and anyone who's researching either their own history, another institution, um, I'm obviously really looking forward to the Commission's report, A, because a lot of research has gone in by some very qualified uh, people, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. But there is sometimes an issue where this all still seems to have an element of um, secrecy or there seems to be a privileging of who gets to look at, at what. And like I, as an academic, get a privilege at times to look at things that, say, a survivor won't get to look at. And that's really... I guess, an approach that maybe we need to start questioning more and more, not so much which group or which person or which institution, but I think, you know, people who've been writing about transitional justice, that's really where we need to be with the empathy that Pat and, and Catherine are talking about. So I guess I'll just go around the houses on this. The commission is going to report the end of October. Will everyone be happy? There still needs to be a redress scheme, memorialization. These are, are also next steps. So um, if if maybe I'll, I'll go to Catherine and then to Pat. Catherine, do you want to come in there? Well, um, uh, redress and um, it, it isn't really at the fore for a lot of the people that I have met and that I have dealt with. Um, and as regards memorialization, I have, um, I have, a, uh, we'll say, um, I'm not too keen on that as being in the, in the, up in the forefront because of the trouble we had in Tune, because uh, our own Galway County Council, they tried to bring in memorialization uh, back in 2018 instead of uh, excavation. So uh, that is at the bottom of our list. Excavation first, um, ex exhumation and proper reinterment and then put up a more memorial, either where the babies were or where they'd be reinterred. Now, that is a huge issue with us. And we have we've had to fight that quite a lot, that there's no way we are putting a memorial over children in a sewage tank. And there is no way that a sewage tank area with holding the remains of all those little babies can be blessed or consecrated. That came up as well. And that is an absolute no from us, from, from, from our team. So, um, I, I, sorry, what was the other question? No, uh, no, was... that, that's it, Catherine. You, yeah. okay. you answered it perfectly. And then, too, I yeah. suppose sometimes even memorialization can be um, passed, even like this archive or, oh, yes. or is... digitization of documents or more access. Um, that, that's yeah. fine. So it's, just, it's just that word was used. Uh, to, to try and cover up the whole thing again and uh, we are very sensitive about that but as regards the university and your archive it's a fantastic idea and it's needed so badly 
So th that is a, a good message. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. And, and Pat, what are your, your final thoughts here? Well, my final thoughts are uh, that I, find, I feel very personally humbled uh, by what we've been discussing today, as I have been when, when I met some of the survivors. Uh, and I think a concern I would have, and it's a concern actually, which I'm being autobiographical on, is that, pe that people involved in wishing and wanting to support the cause of the survivors and the memory of children who died in Chum, that we don't, we don't take over the story or that we don't represent the, their story in any way that is not respectful of the way they want their story represented. And you only have to look at the way um, the Ryan report in many ways, uh, that it was so vast and yet we lost the impact of individual human stories with, with few exceptions on the Ryan report. So my, I see my task and UNESCO's task and my role within NUI Galway, uh, given that I have, a, you know, I have a responsibility around children, youth and civic engagement, with UNESCO is to how can I ensure that survivors are not further abused because I think they're being further abused at the moment by the way the report has not come out and all the things we've heard. But how way and how can I support what's in the hearts and minds of people who, who've been so wronged? Keelan Conal, who'd want to jump in here before I finish up? <laughs> Um, I think that I think access to records is really, really important. I mean, we saw with the burial report coming out that one woman I know found out where her son was buried through an anonymized detail in that report. So survivors have given their testimony to the commission and yet don't have access to their own records that the commission has had access to. So, you know, even if there's thousands of pages of report, that doesn't mean anything if survivors can't access their own personal information. And, you know, adopted people in this country still don't have the right to their own birth information. So I think these are things that are really critical to keep in mind uh, when the report comes out. And Cornell, we'll, we'll have you more as a researcher than a a journalist. Uh, yeah, um, like I, I agree with everything uh, everyone has said there. I mean, to me, the records are, are the key to all of this. I mean, what, as a reporter, my sole goal was to gather as much information through by as many means as I could and, and put it out there. And, and I mean, I knew from the first day I started writing about this that there would have to be a state inquiry to figure it all out. Um, the, the, the commission has a duty to people whose records that they have accessed and that ultimately they'll seal at the end of all of this um, that they do the most thorough job possible. Um, we don't have a great history of commissions of inquiry um, satisfying people. So I hope this one does. Um, fundamentally, I think adoptive people in this country and natural parents uh, should have a full and unfettered right to all of their material. Um, these are their lives, their, their histories. Um, the longer we continue to drag on being unable to pass basic legislation to provide information and tracing for people, um, you know, the more backward this country is going to appear uh, to the outside observer. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, you have to open the records in order to understand this. Um, I mean, for as long as I've been writing about this, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs have been telling me there's nothing to see in the records. An audit of records would yield little useful information. They said that in specific regard to St. Patrick's Guild and then a number of years later announced, God, look, there's all this evidence in these records. Well, the reason you knew that is because you looked at them. So ultimately, open the records, allow the people who own them to view them and allow researchers access redacted versions, administrative records, so we can all put together a narrative of what happened here. Um, and the key thing to that, I think, is when the commission does report, the pity is I think researchers should have access to all of those records, um, or at least in, in as sensitive a way as possible, so that whatever narrative is put out there by the Commission can actually be critiqued by both survivors and by uh, researchers in the area. And I think that's vitally important as well. Thanks to your fantastic panel. I've gone two minutes over my time. Um, to everyone who's watching, thank you so much again. There's, there's more comments coming in, but we'll address them after. And to anyone who has been involved in this that we haven't thanked, we apologize. <laughs> it, it's just been uh, so amazing to have so many people involved the, the last few months. So I'll pass back to Rachel now to uh, close us out. 
Thanks so much, Sarah Ann. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody who's taken part in this virtual launch this afternoon. And especially, I'd like to thank Peter and Teresa, who spoke to us earlier about their own experience of TUM and their own experience of trying to find their birth family. It's honestly been a privilege to be part of it this this afternoon and you know you don't often get to say that and really really mean it but but I do because as we heard Catherine saying there and it's a wonderful line the truth is everything just very briefly before I do wrap up I was reminded when I was listening to Conal there talking about Vespera in particular and about um, illegal registration of adoptions I recently dug out a tape of some interviews I had done as a young reporter back in 1996, so 24 years ago with women who'd been born in Vespera. And one of them then spoke about knowing that her birth cert was a forgery and that the names that had been put down as her birth parents were actually the names of her adopted parents. That was 24 years ago. And it was so easy at the time for that to be buried and for people to walk away from that truth. And I really, really hope that it doesn't happen again. If you'd like to learn more about the Two Moral History Project, you can do so via the NUI Galway website. That's nuigalway.ie and the link is on the home page at the moment. So it's really easy to find and you can view more there and you can also listen to the podcasts we've been discussing this afternoon. So once again, thanks to all the participants and thank you very much. Uh, thanks indeed, as I said, to those who've been following all of this on Facebook over the past few hours. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure.